Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Many people have tried to tell the story of what God has done among us. They wrote that we had been told by the ones who were there in the beginning and saw what happened. So I made a careful study of everything and then decided to write and tell you exactly what took place. Honorable Theophilus, I have done this to let you know the truth about what you have heard. The Gospel of Luke Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, Contemporary English Version. Theophilus, I first wrote to you about all that Jesus did and taught from the very first until he was taken up to heaven. But before he was taken up, he gave orders to the apostles he had chosen with the help of the Holy Spirit. For forty days after Jesus had suffered and died, He proved in many ways that he had been raised from death. He appeared to his apostles and spoke to them about God's kingdom. While he was still with them, he said, Don't leave Jerusalem yet. Wait here for the Father to give you the Holy Spirit, just as I told you he has promised to do. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Book of Acts, Chapter 1, Verses 1-5, through Contemporary English Version Hello, I'm Victoria Kay. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm here today with R.D. Fierro, author, founder of Crystal Sea Books, and part-time storyteller. Today on Anchored by Truth, we're going to launch a new series on the historicity of the books written by Luke. These books include the Gospel account named after him and the Book of Acts. To help us get going in our discussions, we are going to use some extracts from Crystal Sea's upcoming audiobook version of one of R.D.'s books, Doors of Destiny, A Choice Orb's Tale. R.D., would you like to offer a few words of introduction on why we want to take a look at the books in the New Testament written by Luke? Well, most people know that one of the four Gospels was written by a man named Luke. But even a lot of people who recognize Luke as a gospel writer don't focus on the fact that Luke also wrote another book that's included in the New Testament, and that's the book of Acts. Now, of course, most Christians know how important the gospels are to their faith, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. People know how important those books are to their faith. But a lot of people don't realize that the book of Acts is an equally important book in the Bible. Because the book of Acts is a book that's transitional from the Gospels to the Epistles. Now, of course, we get most of our information about Jesus and his earthly ministry from the Gospels. But if we didn't have the book of Acts positioned right there between the Gospels and the Epistles, we would lose an awful lot of the detail, the granularity, you might say, about the content that's contained in the Epistles. And the book of Acts in particular is one of the most important historical books in the Bible just because it contains such a vast amount of the history of the first century A.D. And so the book of Acts contains so much history that if that history weren't accurate, weren't factual, it could call into question the historical reliability of the Bible. And frankly, throughout history, there have been a lot of skeptics or critics who have come to the book of Acts who did not believe that the book of Acts contained history. But the good news is that after being tested now for close to 2,000 years, the book of Acts always proves itself to be exactly what it is, a historical record of the development of the early church after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts is actually critical to our faith because it gives us so much of the information about the history of redemption that occurred in the immediate aftermath of Jesus' death and resurrection. So if we didn't have the book of Acts, we'd have a greatly reduced understanding of some of the content that's contained within the epistles. And the epistles, which of course are just letters written to various churches or individuals, 
The epistles are some of the places where the actual doctrinal formation of the early church was done. The epistles give us details that are missing from the Gospels. The purpose of the Gospels, of course, was to record Jesus' first coming to this earth, give us the details of his birth, of his life, of his public ministry. But, of course, the Gospels end basically with Jesus' death and resurrection. There's been an awful lot of church history that has occurred since Jesus' death and resurrection, and in particular, the early part of the history of the church and some of the earliest information that we have of the church fathers is contained in Acts and in the subsequent epistles. So the really good news is that when skeptics have come to the book of Acts and tested it to determine whether or not the book of Acts and the book of Luke, which was also written, of course, by Luke, they found out that those books are not only spiritually important, but they are valid and historically reliable. So what you're saying is that by taking a look at the historical underpinnings for the books Luke wrote, we can increase our confidence in him and thereby the Bible. And you're also saying that the book of Acts gives us a sort of framework or template which we can use to guide our understanding of many of the other books in the New Testament. So the books written by Luke reinforce one of the fundamental lines of evidence that demonstrate that the Bible is the Word of God, that the Bible is historically reliable. Both the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts contain a lot of historical detail, so if they weren't accurate, it would call into question the accuracy of the revelation that they contain pertaining to some pretty important events like the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons we want to use some extracts from Doors of Destiny to introduce our discussions. You took some of the inspiration for some of the scenes in Doors of Destiny from episodes or people that Luke wrote about. Why don't you help set the scene for the extract that we're going to hear today? I'd love to. The basic story of Doors of Destiny is that there's a group of four siblings who chance upon what we call a choice orb in the story. And the choice orb is sort of a magic marble that takes these kids from Earth to places, as the book says, where the stars were framed and the worlds were formed. So these kids are transported to a supernatural plane where they're going to have all kinds of adventures. And as part of having their adventures, they eventually come to a world that has become perpetually dark. This perpetually dark world is a world of, obviously, grimness. It's a world of desperation. But there is one remaining hope for this world, and that hope for this world is found in the life of a teenage girl named Abigail. And so what Abigail has to do is to place a mighty lamp in the top of an extremely tall but now darkened lighthouse. But in order for Abigail to place that lamp at the very top of this lighthouse, Abigail has to confront a demon who lives in the tower. Now, obviously, the demon is perfectly happy in a world of perpetual darkness, so the demon does not want the lighthouse to regain its light. And that, of course, is Abigail's purpose in life, to restore the light. So this extract from the upcoming Doors of Destiny audiobook is part of the confrontation between Abigail and the tower demon as Abigail seeks to save her world. For a while, the tower was quiet and Abigail climbed in silence. Then, Abigail was hit with another shower of rock, dirt, and dust. Only this one contained larger stones, and some of them bruised her when they hit. She heard a series of raucous shrieks, followed by babbling and crying. Despite the noise and the rock strikes, she kept walking upward. But her legs and arms were growing heavy. She had no idea how much further she had to go. The nail scraping was not far ahead now. Oh, there's a missing step just there. Many, many! You will have to jump to get above them. But you cannot see. But you cannot jump. Turn back before it's too late. Too late! The reedy voice was growing considerably more excited, but Abigail was undeterred. She continued her laborious climb. She then felt the dank air around her being stirred by the flapping of foul wings. The shrieks and the cries grew louder but still she pressed on toward them. Just as she felt that she was almost on top of the clicking talons and scraping nails, she heard and felt them move backward and upward, farther away. You are getting tired, crippled one. You are getting tired. Stop and rest. 
It is said that a true lamp of Kinnereth can bring water out of a rock and make stone into bread. Stop and eat. Rest and drink. I thought you said the lamp would not obey me, and now you would bid me command it? In the prophecy it is written that we do not live by bread alone, but on the words of truth. Abigail never paused, though she was laboring greatly and would gladly have rested. Stop, stop, this is no good. You may fall. Command the lamp to bear you to the top. It can lift you up. You need not climb. You will fall. Fall! Fall! The reedy voice was growing more and more agitated. The words of the prophecy tell us that though we are not to trust in our own strength, that we are not to attempt to test the one who gave the lamp. I will proceed as I have been instructed by the prophecy. Now there was a great volley of shrieking and calling. Abigail could hear the wings beating in frustration. Listen, listen! There is no need for us to fight. You too can serve the woman in purple and scarlet. She can give you much. She can give you everything. Look! She gave us this whole world. Think what she could do for you. Think! Think! It is written in the prophecy that we shall serve only the great light bearer and forbear allegiance to any other. My ancestors were foolish, but we have learned. Beware, foul stench. You are in far more peril now than I. Wow, that was really neat. I'm sure most of our listeners will notice that in that clip, the tower demon was confronting Abigail with the same temptations that Satan placed before Jesus as Jesus was starting his public ministry. And I'm sure most of our listeners will notice that Jesus met those temptations with quotes from the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy to be exact. So, in confronting Satan, even Jesus relied on scripture. That's a great lesson for all of us when we face our own temptations. But unless I'm mistaken, the order of the temptations that you used in that scene from Doors of Destiny was the order that Matthew presented them in his gospel. In writing about those same temptations, Luke wrote about them in a different order. I think you believe that there is an important teaching point about the Bible to be gained from the two different orders that the two different gospel writers used. You're absolutely correct. The order of temptations that we heard in the Doors clip today is the order of the temptations that Matthew used in his gospel. When Matthew wrote about the temptation of Jesus, he put the temptations in a particular order. When he wrote about the temptations of Jesus, Luke reversed the order of the last two temptations from Matthew's report of the event. So, some critics of the Bible claim that the difference in the two accounts is an example of a contradiction in the Bible. Some critics will even go on to claim that the Bible contains hundreds of such purported contradictions, which leads to a general assertion that the Bible isn't true. Yes, and that's often how Bible skeptics will build their case. And we don't really have enough time to address all of the most common examples that are cited as contradictions in the Bible. But suffice it to say that pretty much all of the contradictions, I would go so far as to say all of the main and common contradictions that are asserted that are in the Bible, have been addressed in one form or another. Now, one of my favorite books for addressing these kinds of asserted or purported contradictions is the book entitled Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties that was written by a truly gifted biblical scholar named Dr. Gleason Archer. Archer's prepared this wonderful resource that has hundreds of little topical articles within it, and among those topical articles, Dr. Archer addresses some of the most common items that are asserted as being biblical contradictions. But not only does Dr. Archer address these supposed contradictions in his little mini-articles, what he actually does is answer questions that often crop up about other things with respect to the Bible. And does Dr. Archer specifically address the variation in the two accounts of Jesus' temptations? Yes, he does. And one of the things I really like about Dr. Archer is that he writes in such plain language that it's really easy even for lay people like me to understand the points that he's making. Dr. Archer notes in his article that addresses this topic that the two different gospelists, Matthew and Luke, actually use different words to connect the three temptations, because the three temptations are, of course, items in a series. Now, Matthew, when he wrote about the temptations, used adverbs that are much more specific as to sequence than Luke did. 
Matthew used the adverbs then and again when he was talking about the second and third temptations. So Matthew seems to have been trying to place the temptations in a specific chronological order. But Luke did not use those kinds of sequential adverbs. Luke basically just used the Greek words that mean and. So when Luke was making his report about the temptations of Jesus, he was just saying that all these temptations occurred at about the same time. And so Luke seems to have been more concerned with importance or ideation than with chronology. And this is not too dissimilar from the way a doctor might give a report to a patient about the results of that patient's latest physical. The doctor might say something like, you have heart disease and some arthritis in your knees and bunions. Sounds like the kind of report the doctor might give someone of your age. Uh, No comment. Anyway, a patient would think it was real strange if that doctor spent a bunch of time talking about the bunions just because the doctor thought that that was the first problem that the patient had developed in a chronological order. Really no reasonable doctor would ever start talking about a patient's problems in chronological order. The doctor is going to probably organize his discussion with the patient on the importance of the condition rather than the chronological origination of the condition. So the doctor would organize their report to the patient on the basis of importance or ideation rather than strict chronology. And no one would question the competence of the doctor for making a report like that. In fact, they would probably question the competence of the doctor if the doctor didn't make their report that way. Most of us would expect the doctor to talk to us first about those things that are most important to our health, not about the chronological way that they might have originated. So what Luke seems to have been doing when he made his report about the temptations of Jesus, Luke wanted to show that Jesus overcame natural temptations before showing that Jesus also overcame a supernatural temptation. Because remember that one of the temptations of Jesus was that he could fling himself off from the top of the temple in Jerusalem and the land would have been hundreds of feet below the temple. So uh, when Satan was tempting Jesus to fling himself off of that point and have the angels come and rescue him, Satan was presenting before Jesus a supernatural temptation, the supernatural temptation to have angels intercede and rescue him from jumping from an incredible height. Luke seems to think that that was the most significant of the three temptations. Matthew, though, for whatever reason, just wanted to report the temptations in the same order that Satan presented them to Jesus. The central point, though, is that even though there is a variation in the two accounts, that variation has no bearing whatsoever on the historical reliability of either of the Gospel writers. Luke didn't sacrifice his historical reliability just because in this instance he arranged his account using different criteria. After all, even today we expect some writers to focus on importance rather than chronology in some circumstances. There's a term in journalism called burying the lead, which essentially means that the news reporter didn't start an article with the most important information. An editor would expect a reporter to start an article with the most important incident that occurred at an event, regardless of whether it happened early or late during the overall event. Precisely. And so just because Luke chose to report the temptations of Jesus in a different order than Matthew did, That doesn't compromise in any way Luke's accuracy as a consummate historian. And in fact, we know from other examples found in Luke's writings that he was extremely attentive and detail-oriented as a historian. In fact, Luke got some things right even when other ancient historians got them wrong. Can you give us a specific example? Yes. Let's start by listening to a passage of scripture from our audio library. And this passage of scriptures is from the book of Acts, chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. 
There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lycaonian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. Now this passage implies that the cities of Lystra and Derbe were cities in the Roman district of Lycaonia, but the city of Iconium was in a different district. Paul and Barnabas went to this different Roman district because it would have been under another government. Paul and Barnabas went there because they thought that that Roman district would be safe for them. Now, later Roman writers such as Cicero contradicted this passage because they asserted that the city of Iconium was also in the Roman district of Lycaonia. And for years, this was used as a criticism to show the historical unreliability of the book of Acts. But it turns out that the archaeological discoveries in the 20th century prove that Luke was right after all. Yes, exactly. Sir William Ramsey was one of the most important archaeologists of the first half of the 20th century. And Sir William Ramsey started out as a huge skeptic of the Bible and the book of Acts in particular. But after years of performing exhaustive excavations for himself, Ramsey became converted, and Ramsey famously wrote that Luke was a consummate historian, in part because in 1910, Ramsey himself discovered an inscription declaring that in the first century A.D., Iconium was under the authority of Phrygia from A.D. 37 to A.D. 72. Now, it was only during these years that Iconium was not under the authority of Lycaonia. So Cicero had good reason for believing that Iconium was under the jurisdiction of the Roman province of Lycaonia because it had been for much of its history, but not during the years that Paul and Luke visited that city. So not only did Ramsey's discovery in 1910 confirm the accuracy of the statement in Acts 14, It also showed that whoever wrote the passage in Acts knew what district Iconium was in at that time. This basically makes the writer, the author, as an eyewitness to the events of that history. So even a skeptic, Sir William Ramsey, who started out initially as a Bible critic, but after doing his own homework, so to speak, wound up being convinced of the Bible's historical reliability. And I think that's a great example for us all. Not very many of us will have the opportunity to travel to the Middle East or the other places that the Bible describes. But today there's a wealth of resources that are available to us in our own homes. In addition to books like Dr. Archer's Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, there's a ton of free information available from the Internet. We'll include some links to some of the articles that we found most helpful in the notes that accompany the podcast version of this episode. By the way of summary for today, Luke who is not only a physician, but also a historian, mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, and 9 Mediterranean islands in the Acts. And he got them all right, as attested to by extra-biblical sources. Right. And during the next couple of episodes on Anchored by Truth, we're going to delve a little more deeply into more specific examples of how careful a historian Luke actually was. Well, before we close for today, Why don't you remind us why we focus so much on bringing this kind of detailed information to our listening audience? Well, most people know that only God can change the human heart, and it's up to God to bring that person to Christ. But what we can do is to help people understand that they don't have to give up their intellectual faculties, their desire to use their minds in exchange for some kind of leap of faith into an abyss. The history in the Bible is supported. It's supported by all kinds of evidence. And that evidence is backed by reason and logic. So we can use evidentiary basis, reason and logic, to help people, both believers and unbelievers, start to grapple with the questions that they're finding about their faith. And that's why we started Anchored by Truth, to provide a starting point for Christians to be able to do their own investigations and develop their own confidence in the fact that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Sounds like a great time to have a prayer. Since one of our hopes is that the light of God's Word would once again shine throughout our nation, how about if today we listen to a prayer for our nation? A Prayer for the Nation 
Almighty and Sovereign Father, you are the one true and perfect ruler of all that is and all that ever will be. The stars move at your command, and the cosmos stretches out by the works of your hands. If the heavens themselves and all they contain are ruled by you, then how much more are the nations of men subject to your eternal reign? Lord, we come to you today to pray for our nation, the United States of America. In our Pledge of Allegiance, we pledge that this is one nation under God. May it truly be so. May our people recognize that we owe our existence to you and that you are the rightful master of this nation and indeed all creation. Nations rise and fall at your command for you ordain and govern all the affairs of this world. We pray, Lord, that this nation might find favor in your sight as we turn and look to you. We know that there is much about our nation and people today that does not please you and does not conform to your will. Forgive us for this, mighty Lord. In too many ways, we have wandered from the truths upon which we were founded. We repent of our wanderings and especially the part we have played in them. We have too often lost sight that we will all be held accountable to you and this has led to foolish pride and unwise presumption. Bring us to a renewed sense of your holiness and justice and help us to rebuke our failings. Help us to humble ourselves so that we may begin again to walk straight paths as we depend on you. Lord, there are many other nations and groups in this world that would seek our harm and even our devastation. Even now, many conspire against us. We pray that you would not allow them to succeed. Do not let our stumbles become an occasion for their joy. We pray that you would confound them in their efforts to cause us harm and injury. We do not ask this on the basis of our goodness, but on the basis of your mercy. Do not let them become proud by granting them a victory as we struggle for restoration. Lord, give wisdom and instruction to our leaders at all levels, both civilian and military. Turn their hearts to you and bring them into direct contact with your transforming character. Remind them that they are your stewards and that all their authority comes only from you. Let the name of your Son be lifted up in our hearts as we rejoice in the restoration and salvation he brought. We glory and hope in his name, and it is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Because a lot of our radio episodes are linked together in series of topics, we want to remind listeners that if they missed any episodes, or if they just want to hear one again, all these episodes are available on your favorite podcast app. To find them, just search on Anchored by Truth by Crystal Sea Books. We hope you'll be with us next time as we continue our discussion of the remarkable historical accuracy of Luke, who was not only a physician who addressed bodily needs, but a historian who continues to minister to spiritual needs today. We hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also. If you'd like to hear more, Try out crystalseabooks.com where we're not famous, but our boss is.